Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for October for the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Uh, my name is Hugh Daigle. I'm an associate professor in petroleum and geosystems engineering, and I'm also affiliated with the center. The Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment is a, an organized research unit with 27 affiliated faculty spanning a variety of disciplines related to subsurface energy in general. Uh, we cover everything from reservoir engineering to enhanced oil recovery to formation evaluation, hydraulic fracturing and geothermal and all kinds of other wonderful things. To give you an idea of the types of research that we do, here are some diagrams showing the different applications, disciplines, and tools that we use in our research. You can see that a substantial amount of our work continues to be on conventional oil and gas, but we are also getting into various aspects of the energy transition, including CCUS, geothermal, um, and some other um, emerging, uh, emerging areas. Um, we use a variety of different technical disciplines in our research, a lot of reservoir engineering and production engineering, but also data analytics, machine learning, um, petrophysics, formation evaluation, geology, and a variety of other different disciplines. The tools that we use um, leverage our wonderful laboratory facilities and computational facilities here at UT Austin, including various experimental work, modeling, um, software development, um, and um, you know microfluidics, micromodels, and um, you know a lot of multidisciplinary work. Our research is supported in part by our industrial affiliate programs, which allow us to interface directly with industry and do a lot of good work that's of interest to industry. Um, we have a number of different um, IAPs here. If you want more information on these, I encourage you to visit the CSEE website where you can get more details on what sorts of projects are going on and get in touch with the people who are in charge of these different IAPs. Our monthly webinar series continues this month. These are intended to be informative but industry-driven webinars, so they're of interest to all of you out there who I, I hope are watching and, and have been enjoying these. Um, we host them on the two, second Tuesday of each month at noon Central Time, and we do this on Microsoft Teams. Um, we upload then the webinars uh, to our YouTube channel uh, within a few days. And I checked the YouTube stream last week at, at, at some point. We have almost a thousand subscribers and a lot of the videos have been very well watched. So I encourage you to go there and you can go back and see some of the other webinars that we've had. Um, just uh, to sh um, give you a heads up on what's coming up, our November webinar on the 14th will be given by Julia Gale, who's at the Bureau of Economic Geology. And then myself, uh, Hugh Daigle, will give the December webinar um, on December 12th. So look for more information on those as the time approaches. Now, for today's webinar, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A section. And we'll get to those at the end of the webinar, as many questions as we can, time permitting. So remember, again, put them in the Q&A. And so it's my pleasure to introduce today's webinar speaker, uh, Dr. Gideon Dorji. Uh, Dr. Dorji comes to us from the University of Wyoming, where he finished his PhD, and he did his undergraduate um, in Ghana, um, his, uh, his home country. Um, He's won a number of um, awards during his time at Wyoming. He's you know, very well regarded and very well published, and we're really excited uh, to have him here today. He's gonna to be talking about EOR and fractured carbonate reservoirs using nanoparticles and low salinity water. So this is um, you know, something I'm very interested in, and I hope you all are too. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Dorji. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Dego, for the introduction. Again, uh, my name is Gideon Doji, and uh, today I'm going to be presenting um, on enhanced oil recovery from fractured carbonate reservoirs using nanoparticles with low salinity water and surfactants. And um, also, I'd like to remind us all again, if we have questions, uh, we could post them in the Q&A session, and at the end of the presentation, I'll do well to, uh, to answer your questions. So for today, uh, I'll give a brief introduction uh, mainly on the various individual fluids, EOR fluids that we used um, in our study. I would also give a brief uh, literature review uh, from which we drew out um, the motivation for this work. 
I'll talk about the two main experimental studies um, that we carried out, which was a part of uh, a part of my PhD um, uh, work. And then finally, I'll draw out um, some summary and conclusions from the work. So um, globally, um, the significance of oil production, especially in the face of increasing demand for energy and uh, its resources, of course, cannot be overstated. There are several types of um, reserves that we see in the world, but about 60% of the world's oil reserves are found in carbonate um, reservoirs, which of course uh, shows uh, the importance of studies that have that have featured carbonate reservoirs. So there are some challenges um, which we see um, prevalent in carbonate reservoirs, among which we have heterogeneities of um, of the rock, and then also because that they are commonly fractured. Um, typically, they are referred to as naturally fractured reservoirs or NFRs. But for this work, we are going to refer to them as uh, fractured carbonate reservoirs, FCRs. So um, as a result of the challenges that we see in fractured carbonate reservoirs, um, typical water flooding, you know, flooding or brine injection is uh, highly ineffective. And also because of the fracture matrix permeability and storativity stor contrast that are prevalent in FCRs, we normally experience an early water breakthrough and of course, poor uh, sweep efficiency, which are drastically affects uh, negatively the, the oil amounts that we are able to produce from FCRs. So as a result of this, um, various techniques uh, have been employed. And uh, an example of that is the enhanced oil recovery method, um, which of course is very important, especially when we discuss um, FCRs in order to economically produce from them. So the first um, fluid, EOR fluid, that I want to introduce here is the low salinity water. Now, low salinity water uh, from literature is defined as uh, salinity, water that has salinity of, say, 10 weights percent or less than 10 weights percent. And there are several other types of modifications that are, are done for brine. And so it is referred to as smart water, sometimes engineered water. Uh, but for the purposes of this study, we, we just we would refer to all of them as um, low salinity water. OK, now um, there are two main categories uh, which are used to you know, define the governing mechanisms um, which are at play when you are dealing with low salinity water flooding. So we're looking at the rock to fluid mechanisms and then the fluid to fluid mechanisms, right? So there are several um, of these that you, we could actually talk about, but I just want to highlight, for example, the micro dispersions or what is also referred to as the water in oil uh, micro dispersions. And I'll, I'll, I would um, explain more about this um, as, as we move along. But then these are all the other uh, mechanisms that help, you know, uh, during what low salinity water flooding in especially fractured carbonate reservoirs. So low salinity water flooding um, in literature has been shown also to incur lower capital expenditure and operational expenditure. And of course, as um, um, petroleum engineers, we are also interested in the amount of, uh, you know, money that our uh, activities, um, you know, accrue. So low salinity water flooding also has the tendency to increase oil, oil recovery, as has been shown in several work, and I'll also highlight a few of them in this work. However, uh, some literature have also point, pointed out the some adverse effects um, of low salinity water flooding, which has to do with fines migration. So fines migration, which uh, basically refers to the removal of the particle of the rocks, uh, is typical in sandstones, but then of course it also occurs um, in carbonates as well, causes what we call formation damage. So formation damage um, um, typically is going to block the, the pores of the reservoir and then as a result is going to adversely affect um, oil production, right? But as we'll see as I move on, um, some other research have shown that formation damage could also in some way help in the improving oil recovery. Oh, let's talk about nanoparticles. So nanoparticles have widely been uh, been applied in several other disciplines, you know, in drugs, uh, so many other industries have looked at the application of nanoparticles. So these are just uh, solid particles that 
have size, sizes ranging from one nanometer to 100 nanometers. Um, due to the small nature, they have you know, very desirable characteristics or properties. They are highly mobile in their free state. Um, they have high or large surface area, high surface area to volume ratio. As a result of this, um, they are able to act on surfaces. And to some extent, we could look at them as um, um, surface acting agents uh, to some extent. The application in petroleum fields um, also involve um, different you know, spectrum, but then um, what I want to highlight is they are used for stabilizing fracturing fluid and of course uh, in enhanced oil recovery in improving the amount of oil that we recover. So um, in enhanced oil recovery, what, what is reported in literature is that nanoparticles alter the wettability of the rock and then also um, reduce or alter the, the interfacial tension you know, between the, the fluids in the reservoir. So the nanoparticles um, also help um, in this case to reduce the formation damage, which of course shows their potential um, during LSWF, which is the low salinity water flooding uh, I, I showed you earlier. Nanoparticles also help in reducing surfactant adsorption, uh, which would look at um, in, in, in the next slides when I talk about surfactants. So surfactants actually are, you know, just chemical compounds that have um, short chain fatty, that are sh for, um, short chain fatty acids, which are amphiphilic or what we call amphipathic in nature. So basically they have, uh, for example, if you look at the surfactant monomer, it has a polar hydrophilic head and a, a non-polar hydrophobic tail or or which also you could refer to as a um, lipophilic tail. So this uh, characteristic of a typical surfactant monomer actually helps, um, especially when it comes to the altering of uh, interfacial properties. So surfactants, of course, from the name suffix active, uh, from its name, you could see it means uh, they are suffix acting and they help in the reduction of IFT, which is actually of interest when we talk about enhanced oil recovery. And uh, surfactants have been shown also in some work, I mean, most, most literature actually, to change the wettability of the rock. Again, that is a, a, a beneficial you know, um, occurrence for enhanced oil recovery. Of course, there are some challenges also with surfactants. They become notably adsorbed uh, onto the porous media, and which I showed nanoparticles have the ability to sort of mitigate. And um, surfactants also, um, are affected by salinity and the temperature of the reservoir, uh, especially when it when it's uh, harsh conditions of high temperature and high salinity, um, the uh, optimum operation is is affected. So let's uh, look into literature um, and uh, talk more about the motivation for this work. So, so basically, um, Aspen et al. explained uh, the concept of capi uh, capillary continuity. So for systems um, of high um, water, uh, high water wetness, and then for high oil wetness, we see that as you increase the the water saturation for a system where for a system that is highly water wet, there is a formation of water phase bridges, uh, which actually forms a continuous phase and it gathers water normally at the base of the fracture. So they they explain that um, this, of course, is not the case for um, highly oil wet systems. However, the formation of the wetting phase bridges could also, with time, form a capillary continuity, which aids in um, sweeping water across um, the entire reservoir. Uh, but of course, um, the, the main importance of this is if the system is highly water wet, then of course you're going to increase sweep efficiency and ultimately the oil recovery. Um, so which means that if we have an oil wet system, it, it might not necessarily be, be the case, um, especially um, looking at the fact that it needs more time. Also, we are interested in looking at the forces uh, that come to play when we are dealing with, um, you know, fracture matrix interactions. We're talking about the spontaneous imbibition forces, which are governed by the capillary and gravitational forces. And then we have a third force, which is the viscous forces when uh, we are describing dynamic or forced imbibitions. So we also use two dimensionless numbers, which are the capillary number and the bond number. The capillary number basically um, compares the interfacial forces with um, 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 
um, with the viscous forces, and then the bond number compares the gravitational forces with the interfacial uh, forces. So the core current um, uh, inhibition is used to describe the situation where you have the movement of the, the wetting phase and the non-wetting phase in the same direction. So when this phase is moving count in opposite directions, then we, we generally refer to them as counter current. And, and this is actually the, the situation when we are dealing with capillary forces, uh, whereas for gravitational or buoyant forces, uh, we, are, we, we describe them based on the co-current uh, inhibition. So there are different you know, EOR methods, of course, that you can find in literature that uh, are employed for carbonate reservoirs, especially and owing to the, uh, you know, the heterogeneities and the other challenges that, that are prevalent for this type of reservoirs. However, our focus here in this particular study will be low salinity, will be uh, nanoparticles and surfactants, and of course, I'll be referring to them as LNS as we move along, mainly because uh, when we talk about low sal and nanoparticles, comparatively, they are, you know, cheaper, and then also they are eco-friendly, especially nanoparticles. Okay, so um, some works done by Gatius Muro and Alhura Shawi um, show that low salinity water flooding is able to increase oil recovery. Um, of course, like I said, there are several uh, mechanisms of discussion, but I just want to talk about um, the, the involvement of what we call the MCS, which is uh, magnesium, calcium, and then sulfate ions. Again, they are also referred to as the potential determining ions, and these ions actually help uh, in dissolving the oil components or the polar oil component from the calcium surface, uh, which of course is the cause for the um, wettability uh, uh, alteration towards the oil wetness um, of the calcite surface. So whenever you have these ions, you know, present, they begin to um, change the wettability towards water wetness, and that significantly, you know, improves the oil uh, recovery. Uh, so as I said earlier, micro dispersions have also come up in, you know, several uh, research work where you look at micro dispersions, which are just nano packets of brine that are engulfed, um, you know, um, in uh, polar components of the crude oil. So when this happens, normally what happens is that for low salinity water environments, um, you see a decrease in the ionic strength, and that also increases or give more dominance to the report to the Van der Waal repulsive forces, and which expands the Debye length uh, and the zeta potential, of course, and then that helps in increasing, you know, the water film that accumulates on the surface of the rock, and when that happens, of course, you're going to uh, dissolve the oil from the rock surface, and that ultimately leads to increase in um, in oil recovery. So water micro dispersions have come up a lot. Um, you see some other works done by Mehriban, uh, further adding to the fact that you could have partitioning, which uh, he referred to as uh, PRT, which is the partitioned uh, surface active materials. This also aid in the formation of uh, water micro dispersions. Um, again, of course, um, helping in oil recovery. We want to talk about the fines migration here. So the fines migration, like I said, causes formation damage. But then if you have formation damage um, as a result of fines migration, which leads to the diversion of flax towards the unswept zones in the reservoir, of course, that is going to increase oil recovery. And, um, you know, Chucky et al. also explained that for systems where you have high permeability, low permeability zones, when the formation damage occurs in the high permeability zone, you have the diversion of the flax of course, towards the low permeability zones, and that is going to increase the oil recovery. However, the situation um, adversely affects the oil recovery when you have the formation damage occurring in the low permeability zone. In this case, you could refer to um, you know, the, the matrix, the rock matrix. Um, if that is the case, you have a counter flux towards the high permeability zone, which obviously has um, the lower amount of oil. And so at the end of the day, you don't have a um, you know, an increase in oil recovery. So it could go um, both ways, depending on, you know, which area you have the formation damage um, occurring. So in summary, you could look at works done by Zekri, Gatius Muro, Al Shari, so many others, uh, which kind of like shows the potential of low salinity water, especially in fractured carbonate reservoirs. I want to also highlight um, some works done by, you know, Shannon Mohanty, 
Adi Batla Mohanty, Alam Dari, several others also worked on surfactants, um, showing you know the very good potential that surfactants also have, um, you know, in uh, carbonate reservoirs. So for surfactant flooding, um, you know, the concept of um, alteration in um, wettability, reduction in IFT come come to play. However, we also have uh, some other discussions that involve micro emulsion formation, which again is similar to the, the formation of uh, WMDs, uh, the water micro dispersions, right? And so when you have the formation of micro emulsions again, which are heavier, they move into the matrix, pushing more oil out, you know, into the into the fracture, which has high permeability, and that also increases um, oil recovery in addition to, you know, um, alteration in wettability and IFT. So let me just quickly also explain here um the the concept of ift and wettability alteration so if you have for instance um a core which is uh, um um oil wet in nature the capillary forces are negative so the capillary forces are negative you do not have say for example brine inhibition into this core so your production is mainly due to gravitational forces in the case where you reduce the interfacial tension forces for example by introducing surfactants you still have negative uh, uh, capillary forces if the wettability is not changed. Um, so, of course, again, um, in improvement in oil recovery is just due to gravitational forces. So the desirable case is when you have contributions from both, you know, interfacial or capillary forces and then uh, gravitational forces. In which case, we need to alter the wettability towards neutral or more um, water wetness, and um, that also helps that will help significantly in increasing the oil recovery. So in, in highlighting a few works, we see works done by Baba Dagli and, and you know, Gupta et al. Showing that, you know, injecting surfactant, you know, into carbonate reservoirs, it's able to uh, increase the oil recovery, you know, significantly. I want to also highlight uh, the combination of LNS, which is low cell nanoparticles and surfactants, in their uh, combining state. So, for example, combining low salinity water and surfactant, um, some works have shown that this combining effect is able to significantly improve the oil recovery compared to the individual um, low cell and then surfactant. And this, of course, is as a result of the reduction in the uh, IFT and then also the uh, um, alteration in the wettability towards um, you know, water wetness. So just you know to highlight, um, you know there are several conclusions which we drew from our literature review. But of course, what we see is that there is a synergism among the LNS solutions, which of course has a great potential for EOR applications. And also, what we we saw from our review was uh, that application of nanoparticles for EOR purposes, especially for fractured systems, you know, is really needed because very little attention is paid to this particular area, and um, it's mainly because you know fractured systems are a little bit complex to to analyze. So you could find more um, from this from the from the from our publication in Advances in Color and Interface Science. So let me just quickly move on to talk more about. Um, the EOR experiments which we conducted in our study. So the preliminary study actually looked at um, the injection of LNS, and, and by LNS what I mean is low salinity water nanoparticles and surfactants in different cycles. So these cycles are all alternatively injected into carbonates and sandstones um, you know, to basically arrive at the, the best scenarios, which uh, leads to um, higher ultimate recovery. So, so in looking at different uh, combinations of the LNS in cycles, both individually and in mixtures, um, Olaiwala and Dijan concluded that the, N, the, the alternative in injection of LNS, which means that we first of all injected low cell, followed by nanoparticles and then surfactant in that order, you know, sequentially, um, actually helps or is you know most effective, especially when it comes to um, carbonate. So, in, in in conclusion from that from the uh, from the preliminary study, about eleven percent of the original oil in place could be obtained, you know, from alternatively injecting LNS in this particular order. So, different other 
uh, approaches were, were, were studied where you know we started off with low salinity water injection and then injection the surfactants followed by the nanoparticles and the other we also had the mixture of the low sal and nanoparticles uh, nanoparticles and surfactants so and then this actually was uh, was a promising one and so the whole idea was to then you know um, extend this investigation to include fractured carbonates because the study actually just looked at um, carbonates without um, the, the presence of fractures. So that was the motivation for the work. So the first part that I want to introduce here um, is the experimental study on the alternate injection um, of silica and zirconia nanoparticles. These are type of nanoparticles uh, which we use for this study of course by alternatively injecting it with low salt and then surfactant okay so we used um carbonate cores uh, which of course um come in 12 inches in length but then we we cut it into two so each of the cores are then just six inches in length and then we create the fracture ourselves uh creating the fracture along the longitudinal section and then holding it together uh, using a shrink tube so um, we follow the standard you know, procedure of um, core flooding experiments, first of all, by uh, preparing the cores and determining the porosity. So, so the porosity in this case, we, we determine the porosity using the weight method, uh, which is the saturation method, and then also using um, the porosimeter, right? So the porosimeter or the permeameter also helped us to, you know, to measure the permeability. Again, we use the saturation method in the core flood system to measure the, the absolute permeability, the effective permeability, you know, just to compare um, the results. We, of course, also prepare the individual LNS fluids in this particular study, the low sal, the nanoparticles, and the surfactants separately, as well as also the synthetic brine. We determine the fluid properties, we measure the viscosity and the density. And then to begin the core flooding experiment, we saturate the core with brine, 100% uh, saturation with brine, and then we drain um, you know, the, saturate, the saturated um, core with crude oil, you know, which of course is just the, the drainage process. And then we establish the SWI, and then we age the core for approximately three weeks. Uh, to alter the wettability, and then we recirculate the crude oil to remove the aged core, um, the aged crude oil, and we begin secondary injection of brine. So you inject second, uh, we inject the synthetic brine up to points where we recover no further oil recovery. Uh, we establish the SOR, which is the residual oil um, saturation, and we begin our EOR process. So, like I said, the EOR process begins with low salinity water in this in this order, which we found to be, uh, you know, the most effective low salinity water. And then uh, you inject that to a point where you no longer, you know, see um, or observe um, recovery or recovery from the core. And then you switch to nanoparticles, um, same procedure. And then finally, you you conclude with surfactant for the first cycle. And then you you start again with low sound nanoparticle surfactant. So basically, it's just alternatively injecting this LNS in that particular order, and then you determine, you know, the recovery. So basically, this is the setup that we used for uh, this particular study: uh, three physics pumps, one core holder. Uh, I just wanted to point out this because uh, one of the things we realized from our study was. The, the, we, the in this first part we actually use um, hand pumps so we use two hand pumps one for you know the back, the back pressure regulator and then the other pump we used which is the hand pump was used for the confining for exerting the confining pressure on the core or the overbedding pressure so we what we find out which I'll later explain is using quizix pump for this actually removed a whole lot of noise um, from our data right from our del P the, the differential pressure which was recorded by uh, the pressure transducer. So I just wanted to, to point that, that out um, as we move along. Um, I'll explain to details. So for the, the characterization of uh, fractured core, in terms of determining of the fracture aperture and uh, the, the fracture permeability and you know, the other properties, we, we use the slit analog of uh, the Hagen Poisson equation combined with the Das's law. Um, you know, and then also the Das's law um, across parallel and continuous layers. Um, it, this tool was used basically to characterize um, a fractured core. 
So I want to introduce the spontaneous inhibition uh, which we used um, for this side of, of the or for this part of the investigation. We basically use this to to test the applicability of the individual LNS solutions to produce beyond the base solution, which is the synthetic brine. So standard procedure again, um, you know, looking at the various calls that we use. Of course, these calls are smaller um, because of the inhibition cells that we used. Um, they are just three inches in length and then 1.5 inch in diameter, uh, five, five calls overall. But of course, we dry the calls 24 hours um, we use the weight method to, to determine you know, the properties and then again also measure measure it with uh, the porosimeter premium meter. So the vacuum saturation method um, helps us to, to saturate the core uh, with crude oil for like 24 hours. Um, and then of course we are using the same experimental condition as the first inhibition. So in this case, we are aging it again three, three weeks at 70 degrees C um, temperature. And then, you know, we we take out the, the, the aged cores, place them in the inhibition cells, you know, and then fill each of these inhibition cells with brine and then the LNS solutions. We measure the oil recovery against time, you know, just to uh, determine the ultimate oil recovery for each of these scenarios. The setup, the, you know, the goniometry setup we used for measuring the interfacial and contact angle measurement uh, actually featured the captive bubble technique. So cap captive bubble technique helped us to measure the contact angle and then the pendant drop bottom up method uh, was used to measure the interfacial tension. So of course it's bottom up because the surrounding phase was the denser phase, right? So uh, this was the setup we used for, um, for measuring these two properties. So uh, the spontaneous inhibition which we carried out for each of these um, fluids like I said, to determine the applicability for the first inhibition experiment showed that um, the LNS solutions um, had you know, great potential in, 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 in um, improving the oil recovery beyond the base solution, right, beyond the brine. So as expected, we see the only solution um, here which actually produced less of the oil recovery um, compared to the brine was the SDS. And of course, this is because SDS is an anionic surfactant and uh, which has you know, negatively charged surfaces. And um, the calcite surfaces uh, under high temperature are positively charged. So there's going to be an absorption um, you know, of the, um, nano, uh, of the um, anionic surfactants onto the calcite surface, which is going to affect the interfacial tension reduction potential of the, of the SDS. So, so that is what we observed for the spontaneous inhibition. And of course that was expected, but all the other um, fluids, EOR fluids performed better than the, the base fluid, which was brine. Okay. So then we moved on to investigate um, further the, the ability of this fluid. Again, in the same, we, we tried to, to uh, perform this also using the same sequential um, you know, ingestion technique which we used for the core flooding experiment, you know, just so we could compare the results. So what we realized here was that the uh, each of the fluids, of course, reduced the contact angle, you know, um, beyond the value which was observed for brine, in, in which case we see that that was highly oil wet. And then also the zirconia nano, uh, the zirconia nanoparticles. So the first part used silicon nanoparticles. The second part used the zirconia nanoparticles. And for both scenarios, we are we are able to see a slight reduction in the contact angle. Um, and for most, for for the most part, we see that the silicon nanoparticles reduced it drastically compared to all the other all the other fluids. We also observed for the interfacial tension between the crude oil and then the EOR fluids that the, the most reduction in IFT uh, was observed for, for, the surfacet, for the surfactant, of course, which is the, the anionic surfactant. But interestingly, what we see is that the combination, we, we use the combination, for example, between the zirconia and then um, low salinity water, zirconia nanoparticles, and then SDS, to see the effect that these fluids have on the interfacial tension reduction of the zirconia nanoparticles. So what, so what we see is that combination of this uh, this fluid 
which is the L the LSW and then the SDS um, sodium dodecyl sulfate surfactant actually reduces the interfacial tension be beyond uh, the individual um, beyond their individual fluids or solutions, uh, which is actually interesting because that is going to play out significantly in um, the oil recoveries that we, we see during the first uh, or, or the dynamic inhibition experiment. So um, conclusively, what we see is the in alternative injection of the LNS into the fractured core um, using the silicon nanoparticles in the first case was able to recover about 7.6% of the original oil in place, um, whereas for the Zekuna nanoparticles, we observe approximately about 7% of the original um, oil in place. So, so uh, like, like I said, you know, the, the differential pressure or the Del P, uh, which was recorded, you know, had so much noise in it, of course, because um, of the hand pump that we used in the first set of experiments. So we improved on this. Uh, by using a quick pump to actually supply a fairly constant, um, you know, um, value of the confining pressure, um, which of course I'll talk more about that in in the uh, in the other phase of the work. So the summary is that you know if you have same polarities occurring at the COBR, which is the crude oil brine rock interface, you have the expansion of electrical double layer. And the expansion of the electrical double layer thickens the water film on the surface of the calcite, and that leads to the alteration in waterability from oil wet towards water wetness. Now, also, when you have a reduction in the attractive forces at the COBR interface as a result of decrease, like I explained earlier, as a result of decrease in your ionic strength um, or decrease in salinity of course, which is due to the injection of low sal, it creates an increase, right, in the magnitude of the zeta potential or the demyelinant. And when that happens, you are you're going to influence the formation of um, the water film again on the surface of the calcite, and then that leads to the desorption of oil from the surface of the calcite uh, as a result of wettability alteration. So that is what we see during the low salinity water injections. Um, for the Zekona nanoparticles, because we did not really observe, you know, very significant um, alteration in wettability. Um, however, I, I mean, um, when we in, when we individually inject the the Zekona nanoparticles, however, for the Zekona nanoparticles, we realize that they have an ability to reduce the the viscosity of the crude oil. Actually, it's a catalytic process, um, aqua thermolysis of the crude, uh, of the of the C to C bonds in the crude oil, which are the, the the components that are broken down, reducing the viscosity of the oil um, at high temperatures. Right. So when that happens, of course, there's going to be an enhancement in the sweep efficiency during this injection process, and displacing the absorbed oil from the surface, and that would help in you know contributing to the positive dejoining pressure. And that also ultimately increases the oil recovery. But interestingly, uh, the cycle of injection that we see, which has to do with the LNS, as a result of the prior injection of the nanoparticles in the sequence, right? So what uh, what we see is that the prior injection of the nanoparticles in the sequence aided the the oil recovery during the surfactant uh, injection. So as I showed you in the spontaneous inhibition, we realized that because you are dealing with static inhibition, right? So there is no forced inhibition for static inhibition experiments. And so when there's absorption of the surfactants onto the calcite surface, uh, you know, you don't have reduction in um, interfacial tension because there is no inhibition of surfactants into the matrix. However, when you have a prior injection of nanoparticles in this particular sequence, nanoparticles absorb the surfactants, preventing them from being absorbed notably on the on the calcite surface and that also helps you know the interfacial or enhances rather the interfacial tension reduction ability of the surfactant and that was what helped in you know in the improvement in the oil recovery uh, as we observed you can find details you know of this work in um, industrial and engineering chemistry research i want to talk about the second phase um, of this of this study which features uh, the surfactant um, you know, implementation of surfactants for alternative 
alternating injection with LOSA and gamma aluminum nanoparticles. So in this case, we are interested in looking at the other type of surfactants. So we looked first at the anionic surfactants. We wanted to look at the applicability of the cationic surfactants and then the non-ionic surfactants, as well as incorporating another type of surfact um, nanoparticles, which is the gamma aluminum nanoparticles, which um, in literature also has a great potential in uh, EOR. So, so here I, I, I brought this up because um, it's very important for us because in using the Quizix pump, we are able to you know, produce um, a very good representation of our Del P um, as compared to using the hand pump. But uh, every other thing else was the same. The same setup was used for this second phase. And then also we had to use another another crude oil. So the first crude oil that we used in the first part of the work was very heavy, about 140 centipoise CP. Um, this had about, say, five centipoise. So, so um, although it was not planned, we see that this could be a means of um, looking at different type of system, say the heavy crude oil system and a light crude oil system. Um, so the application of LNS could, could actually be looked at for both systems. And so just to compare, we, we run FTIR, um, you know, to compare the uh, the various functional groups in the crude oil, and actually they have very comparable, um, you know, functional groups. So the the main difference here was the viscosity of the two of the two crude oils that was used. So again, we had to test uh, the applicability of the individual um, fluids that we used for the first inhibition experiment. And um, from this again, we see that all the LNS fluids in this particular case produced more than. Um, the base solution, which is the brine. And in this case, we are using C90 tab as the cationic surfactant, and then we are using Triton X100 as the non-ionic surfactant. So, so first off, uh, we want we wanted to apply, you know, the best case scenario between the two surfactants that we used. And so this was one of the criteria that we used to determine which of these two to use for the first inhibition. So here we see that overall the cationic surfactant produced more. Um, oil than the non-ionic surfactant. Again, we want we would want to further investigate that. Um, so we had to also, you know, look at the contact angle measurements, and also this will help us to select between the C90 tab and then the uh, Triton X100 uh, for the application of uh, the alternative injection of LNS. So the contact angle measurements reveal that you know C19 tab is able to reduce. Um, the contact angle towards, you know, neutral wetness. And then we also see same for uh, gamma aluminum nanoparticles, although the most uh, reduction was, was observed for C19 tab. The Triton X100 uh, compared to the C19 tab, you know, could not significantly you know, reduce the, the uh, contact angle, I mean, in terms of uh, comparison. Uh, but Every other uh, fluid in the LNS injection cycle, you know, showed in a similar uh, reduction ability. So we measured also the interfacial, you know, uh, tensions between the crude oil and the individual um, LNS, and then we see the most reduction was uh, recorded for the C19 tab. Um, of course, C19 tab performed better than the Triton X100, which ultimately leads to us using only the C19 tab for the first uh, inhibition experiment. Again, uh, as we observed previously, the combination of, for example, gamma aluminum nanoparticles and the C19 tab uh, reduce the interfacial tension more than you know, the individual um, gamma aluminum nanoparticles, which again, like I said previously, it's very important for the alternative injection um, procedure, as I'll show you in the results. So the first cycle of injection, we observed um, an interesting trend. So after synthetic injection of brine, the cycle started as usual with this um, the LSW followed by nanoparticles and then C19 tap. So LSW was able to produce some amount of of good oil, CTAP also produced some amount of, of crude oil, um, but we did not observe any production for gamma aluminum nanoparticles in the first cycle. So in fact, I, we actually, actually had to increase the cumulative um, injected pore volume beyond two. So we established 
um, for this particular set of experiment that two power volumes was actually the optimum um, you know, power volume that we could recover most um, oil for each of the cycles from our previous study. But then we increased this to about like 2.7 power volumes, um, but we still did not observe any um, oil recovery during the gamma aluminum nanoparticles. And then interesting in the second cycle, of course, we, we recorded more um, oil recovery in LSW uh, injection, but then we, we recorded some um, oil recovery during the second cycle injection of gamma aluminum nanoparticle. And this is very important uh, uh, because, um, because of the, you know, the COBR interactions as our, our, our highlights, we move on as we move on. Of course, uh, the second cycle injection of C19 tab also, you know, produced some amount of crude oil. And then the cycle actually just ended with the third injection of uh, low salinity water. All the other you know, injection cycles did not really yield anything. So, um, you know, hence the exclusion from, from, from the graph. But interestingly, oh, um, what, what we see is that cycle one brings about 4.86, um, you know, cycle two about nine, cycle three about four. And overall, we are able to ultimately produce 18% in this particular um, sequence of the original um, oil in place. Um, you could you, you could actually find details um, about this. Um, we, we published that in Energy in Fools, but I want to just um, highlight the, the conclusions that we drew out from this particular study, especially in regards to uh, the second phase of this work. Um, where we, we did not see an increase in the oil recovery during the injection of the gamma aluminum nanoparticles. Um, first off, let me just say that the design of the core flooding experiment, which we developed for this work, you know, was very much fitted for enhanced oil recovery in fracture carbonate reservoirs, right? So it adequately meets the goal of this study. It was to see how applicable the alternative injection of LNS would be for uh, fractured carbonate reservoirs. So the sequential injection of LNS uh, works because we are able to um, increase, uh, you know, the recovery by alternatively injecting silica nanoparticles, zircona nanoparticles, um, anionic surfactant in the first in the first phase of this study, and then in the second phase we also see uh, there is um, an increase in. Uh, oil recovery when we included the gamma aluminum nanoparticles and then also the cationic surfactant. And of course, the cationic surfactant was as a result of uh, uh, the comparison that we made with the non ionic surfactants of which uh, cationic surfactants produced more. So the two categories of the core flooding experiment that we performed shows that uh, we are able to increase significantly the oil recovery up to so up to about 18 percent of the original oil in place but uh what i wanted to stress here was the fact that the injection cycle which we adopted for this particular study helped in enhancing the individual performance of the lns so if you if you recall from from the introduction and the literature review we see there is a synergism um, that is reported in the literature when we basically inject you know lns into fcrs right so the first cycle of injection for gamma alumina nanoparticles for which we did not observe uh, an increase in the, in the oil recovery was as a result of the high ift that was associated with the gamma alumina nanoparticles but because of the sequence of injection, which is LNS, the cationic surfactants, um, which uh, subsequently was injected after the, the first cycle injection, aided in, in significantly reducing, first of all, the interfacial tension, and then also altering the wettability, which enabled the gamma alumina nanoparticles to make contact with the oil. So because if, if IFT is very high, our gamma aluminum nanoparticles would not imbibe into the matrix for which uh, we see um, um, some characteristics of gamma, nan gamma aluminum nanoparticles behaving similar way to zircona nan aluminum nanoparticles in reducing the oil viscosity. So that is possible if you have a reduction in IFT and you have alteration in wettability. And if you're able to do that, then you have your gamma aluminum nanoparticles um, aiding in the reduction of um, the 
crude oil as a result of the breakdown of the C2C bonds, and this would help in improving oil recovery. So this is one of the very uh, interesting concepts that uh, we could see from, from this particular study um, where, you know, the cycle of injection is important, you know, in optimizing the um, oil recovery that we, we obtain from um, fractured carbonate reservoirs. So I would like to um, quickly just acknowledge um, some individuals. I want to acknowledge, first of all, um, Dr. Matez Dijam, who was the PI for this particular project, and also Dr. Saeed uh, Olaiwala for the, the preliminary studies which he carried um, out for his PhD. I also want to um, acknowledge the Department of Energy and Petroleum Engineering in the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences um, at the University of Wyoming for the financial support. And thank you everyone um, you know, for attending these presentations and uh, I'll take your questions now. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is quite common for field development to include water flooding as part of secondary recovery. The injected water in most cases, especially in offshore fields where seawater is injected, tends to have high salinity. If low salinity water flooding EOR is undertaken, subsequent to implementation of such water flooding program, then a significant effort, both time and OPEX, goes towards lowering the overall salinity of the water in the reservoir, where saline water has already established its presence across the preferential flow channels. My question is, can the introduction of nanoparticles in low salinity water flooding help minimize the time taken to attain the intended ILDE, which otherwise would have um, been possible only after lowering the overall salinity. Thanks. Okay. So, um, if I get what what um, the the question really is asking for is if there is uh, going to be an added advantage um, in in using nanoparticles. Um, with low salinity water flooding in, uh, you know, in lowering the time or, of course, the um, operational expenditure that is involved in uh, low salinity water flooding. So, to be honest, uh, nanoparticles applications uh, in this particular field um, would actually also introduce some form of, um, you know, operational cost. And of course, its application also is going to increase the time, um, you know, in the overall applicability. So, but um, what I what I can say to that effect is, if if we combine the nanoparticles with the low salinity water flooding, like we did, in which case we ultimately increase, you know, significantly the oil recovery, then of course uh, we are making up for the time that we spend. So, so really, in my opinion, in using the nanoparticles. Um, could also increase the time of applicability, right? Because it's a different spectra, you know, completely different from, from, from the low salinity water, um, you know, injection or applic application. Unless, of course, we come up with a program where the usage of the nanoparticles um, would reduce, would just, you know, may maybe reduce the applic application of the low salinity water flooding. Generally, what I see is it's going to also increase operational um, expenses and also increase the time of, of, of application. So um, that is what I, I could say to that. Of course, um, if there is a program that could help minimize that, I would definitely appreciate it. But the incorporation of nanoparticles also increases, um, you know, the time and the expenses, uh, in my opinion. So, yeah, I hope that helps. It says, can naturally fractured carbonates uh, be used to investigate the effectiveness of the LNS alternating injection technique, or how can the fractures be made to mimic NFLs? Yeah, so um, the the NFLs, which of course is the naturally fractured um, reservoirs, um, the the whole concept is the fact that they have a lot of fractures, right? So they have a lot of fractures which um, um, are prevalent in the in the formation, and so um, there are other techniques. I would, I would, I would say that we could incorporate um, in this particular um, investigation, 
which will help us determine, you know, the the type of fractures that are prevalent. Because for for example, in in our case, we only looked at you know the longitudinal direction of creation of fracture, which of course is uh, is you know the base. So uh, the base form of you know fracture creation because the fractures are going to be naturally created in 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 real applications. So, but of course we have to start from you know the the less complex uh, situations as much as we can. But in order for us to upscale to reservoir conditions, we would have to incorporate um, you know other fracture orientation. So, so in effect, uh, what I would recommend is yes, there are other fracture creations that we can create in the core. So for example, we might want to look at the diagonal orientation of fractures. We might want to look at horizontal, or in, in which case we are looking at um, transverse, right? Transverse section creation of the fracture to see how that could also impact the overall um, you know, recovery, overall recovery of oil. So we could start from that. I've seen several work also which try to exert stress on the core, uh, which creates fractures. So you kind of like increase the confining pressure on the core creating, and that uh, actually mimics, you know, natural fractures more compared to, you know, just physically creating the fracture yourself. But again, that poses complexities to your, you know, analysis. Um, so if 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 you want to start from, you know, the, the less the the less complex or the least complex uh, fractures, um, that would be, you know, highly desirable. But like I said, you might also want to look at um, other type of, you know, fracture orientations uh, in the, in your analysis. Another question is how small can the slugs be and still be effective? So um, by the slugs, you mean the surfactant slugs or because uh, for this particular study, we did not look at um, the overall combination of LNS. So we injected the LNS fluids individually. Of course, you are going to have residual, you know, saturation of each of these components after each injection cycle. And when that happens, of course, you are going to have combination. And that was actually the reason why we studied the interfac interfacial tension reduction ability of, uh, you know, the combining effect of these fluids. Um, that was the reason why. But um, if if you mean the size, how small can the, the slugs be and still be effective? If you mean for the nanoparticles, so so for the nanoparticles, um, emulsions or dispersants, we use about 0.05 weight percent, and then which is small actually, a small concentration, and then we still see improvements in the oil recovery. So this is actually interesting because um, I highlighted that nanoparticles have very desirable characteristics owing to their small nature in size. And so because they have high, you know, surface area to volume ratio, they have a large surface area, they, they need just about small amounts for, you know, implementing, you know, huge stacks because they are very small in, in nature. So you can use small amounts of nanoparticles, for example, like 0.05 weight percent, which of course we determined um, from our optimum measurements. We had to, you know, look at, you know, their viscosity, the ability to alter the viscosity, the ability to change the interfacial tension and wettability. That was the base for which we established the optimum concentration. But then, um, you, you could use very small, the, the whole idea is you could use very small amounts of nanoparticles to achieve, you know, very desirable results. And that is one of the interesting thing about nanoparticles because it's going to have an imprint on the overall cost that we incur in their operations. So if it's for the nanoparticles, we are using, for example, about 0.05% in this case. If it's for the, um, if it's for the surfactant, the SDS surfactant that we used the XDS was about 0.1. So uh, conventional practice is for you to make sure that the concentration of your SDS is above uh, CMC, which is the critical uh, mice of concentration, right? So any concentration that you are using above CMC, of course, again, incorporating the other harsh effects of high salinity, high temperature, right? Really, that is what you, 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 you want to do. So uh, there is no hard and fast rule about that. It depends on the system that you're analyzing, the salinities that you're looking at, but the conventional practices make sure that your um, your concentration of surfactant is above above CMC. So that that is what I can say for, for that. For the low salinity water, you are looking at 
um, salinity is below, like I said, below or around 10, 10,000 ppm or 10 weight percent. Um, that is how, in, you know, and you can go, you know, as low as 500, you know, 600 ppm. Um, and that is also another study that you, you might want to consider, um, you know, in applications of uh, low cell with F F FCR. The, the um, um, conclusion of, of, of our work actually opens up several other, you know, windows for, <clears throat> excuse me, investigation, especially in looking at the fracture creations, you know, because we just use the, just the longitudinal section, you might want to look at several other orientations. Um, and then also in characterizing the, the, the fractures um, or in the application of FCRs using the low salinity water nanoparticle and surfactant, we, we also open up a, you know, a door of looking at several other types of nanoparticles and uh, you know surfactants that that we have. So so really, I just want want to say that um, um, this opens up you know more room for for research um, in 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 this particular area. Um, conclusively, I want to thank uh, the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment you know for the opportunity to present part of uh, my PhD uh, research. And thank you everyone for for joining in.